Hey, it's Dr. Jamie, and I want to personally thank Keto Brick, sponsor of today's Fit and Fabulous podcast. The Keto Brick is a 1,000 calorie shelf stable ketogenic meal replacement bar with perfect ketogenic macros. It was developed by Robert Sykes, the Keto Savage, during his competition prep to optimize his nutritional demands and streamline his meal prep. Robert and his wife, Crystal, have since created a business out of the bricks and keep the entire production in-house to oversee quality control. The bricks are made with only the highest quality of ingredients, such as raw organic cacao butter, the best source for stearic acid. The bricks are incredibly versatile and can be portioned out according to your individual macronutrient and caloric needs. Each brick contains minimal dietary carbohydrates, so you can consume them with confidence, knowing that they will not hinder your fat adaptation, but rather improve your ketogenic nutrition. You can get yours today at www.ketobrick.com and use the code DRFIT, D-R-F-I-T, to be entered into a chance to win a free one week supply of keto bricks. That's right, a one week supply of keto bricks. Four winners will be chosen every single month that this podcast is sponsored. Thank you, Keto Brick. to the Fit and Fabulous Podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hey, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous Podcast. I'm so happy that you're here and listening with us today. I have an amazing guest, and we're going to talk about some really, really cool topics that we've never talked about yet on this podcast. The most important thing that you can do for us, though, is to go leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts. That has the best and greatest impact as far as spreading our reach far and wide all across the world so that people can hear these amazing messages. So thank you to everybody that's left your comments and downloaded and shared them with all your family and friends. So Mr. Robert Sykes, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm super excited about this. Uh, Robert and I have been friends now for some time, but he really kind of lives and works in such a niche space in the natural bodybuilding world. And um, we're going to dive into so many topics today talking about body composition and, and, and diet and mentality and training. But Robert, tell all the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you became Keto Savage. If you guys have, don't follow him, go right now to Instagram, Facebook, Keto Savage. He, he finally got his social media back. They, they took it away from him for a while, but uh, go, go give him a follow. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, my story, I mean, I started lifting back in high school. I was uh, like 115 pounds. I was super small and scrawny. I just wanted to get bigger, gain more confidence uh, just in general. And I I started doing all the traditional bro dieting approaches to nutrition and and weightlifting. I would eat six or seven meals a day, chicken, rice, broccoli, the whole nine yards. And I bulked up to like 230 pounds, got really big and strong, but I did so very uh, unhealthfully. And I went through a couple competition preps. Uh, that first one, I lost like 80 pounds in 12 weeks, did everything wrong, lost a ton of muscle in the process. And I won the show, but I developed a bunch of disordered eating tendencies. And that kind of stuck with me for years and really screwed up my head. Um, so I knew there had to be a better way. So I was constantly dabbling with different types of dieting, the flexible dieting, if it fits your macros, uh, the bro dieting, carb backloading, all these things. And uh, in 2000. 14, I believe after my third or fourth show, I started doing carbohydrate backloading, which is basically a bunch of high glycemic index carbs at night, but then relatively carb free throughout the day. Uh, And I felt good, but I noticed with the carb ups, I'd feel, you know, my my GI system would get all jacked up. Uh, So I decided to just do carb backloading without the carbs. And this was before keto was a thing. So there wasn't really any podcasters or books on the subject. Um, but I started diving deeper into it and my performance only improved. And I, I realized that what I was doing was a ketogenic diet. Uh, so I just kind of took that and ran with it, did a show in 2017 with a fully ketogenic approach, won my pro card and have a look back since. So as you're kind of going through all these different, you know, trials of like, try this, try this, try this, of course, you know, I'm totally into self-experimentation, but ketogenic is not, a, not a common thing in the bodybuilding space at all. Was there somebody that you were kind of looking up to that was doing it? Or was it just seriously, like, I'm going to try this and see how it turns out. It was honestly a lot of just trying it and seeing how it turned out. Because for me, the main priority at that point in my life was to just get over my disordered eating. Like I would binge and purge and it was just really 
screwing up my headspace and my health. Uh, so anything that could beat that was worth my while. And for, for when I adopted the ketogenic diets, I don't know if it was like a psychological thing or if it was a hormonal imbalance or what, but that really helped me break free of those disordered eating tendencies. And so for, for that reason alone, it was worth it for me, whether I ever saw success on a competitive stage again or not uh, was irrelevant, but I noticed that my gym performance doesn't really, didn't really slack at all. So I felt confident that it might be worth trying to do a prep and still do bodybuilding with keto. Uh, but yeah, there wasn't any other bodybuilders doing a ketogenic approach. I was getting all kinds of pushback from the people in my gym at the time saying you would never be able to fill out for a show. You would never be able to have the vascularity, couldn't possibly get lean eating that much fat. Uh, so there's a lot of naysayers for sure, but lo and behold, it worked and it worked really, really well. I, I brought a level of conditioning I never had in years prior. Uh, so I became just super confident in the approach and the lifestyle and to be able to dominate a show in a sport that people just assume you have to have carbohydrates was really empowering for me. So I've since just really tried to get that message out there because in, in bodybuilding, especially natural bodybuilding, so many competitors have these disordered eating tendencies. I mean, that's more common than not. And I feel like a lot of that stems from just poor relationships with food, uh, the binging and purging cycles. And I'm highly motivated to just help them recognize that there's a potentially superior alternative out there for them. And if they see success with it, great. Yeah. So interesting. So not only is he a bodybuilder, but he's a business owner. He's soon to be a dad. We've got a little baby savage on the way this year. Um, and for those of you that, that don't know, Robert owns a company called Keto Brick. I've got one right here for those YouTubers. You can kind of see that right here. This is the buttered maple pecan. But Robert, tell us about the story about Keto Brick. What is it? How is it invented? Yeah. So during my 2017 prep, which was the first prep that I was doing with this ketogenic approach, um, I was, I mean, when I do a prep, I'm tracking everything. I've got all my meals prep for the week. I'm changing macros weekly. And I wanted to just simplify that whole process. I wasn't eating as many meals throughout the day because I was you know, implementing more intermittent fasting, but it was harder to find a good quality fat source without just adding oil to everything. And I wanted something that made macro manipulation on a weekly basis very, very easy. Uh, so I set out to kind of create this product because um, there wasn't really any keto products on the market at the time, certainly none that were within the, the range of macros that I was looking for. Uh, so I just started making things, you know, in the my home kitchen uh, in Washington. I was in Washington State at the time. And these these first versions of the keto brick were freaking ugly. They're not, they weren't re nearly as refined as they are now. Uh, but I figured out a, a formulation using the cacao butter, the protein powders, and, you know, what we now use in the bricks. And it just worked really well. I mean, I was able to have the energy from the fat, but I wasn't getting the bloat or GI distress that a lot of the other options were giving me. So it just kind of became something that worked for my prep endeavors. Uh, and I was documenting the whole prep on YouTube at the time. And people kept asking about the brick, you know, what is it? Where do I get it? How do I make it? Uh, and I just kind of blew it off, not thinking that it was anything really that would gain momentum. Um, but they kept asking. So Crystal, my girlfriend at the time, wife now, we just rolled up our sleeves, dove into the world of creating a food product business and the demand was there and we just kept rocking and rolling with that and it scaled up quite quickly. And yeah, now we employ several people. We've moved to several different warehouse spaces. We just moved to, into our new compound here and we're just excited to keep on growing the business. Incredible. Incredible. What are the, what's the top selling flavors of Keto Brick? Uh, chocolate peanut butter cup is 100% the crowd favorite. Um, but I've got a few formulas in the works. I'm not sure when this podcast is going live, but we've got uh, a new flavor that is finalized in the formulation and that's going to be dropping in February. And that's got uh, even fewer grams of total carbs in the chocolate peanut butter cup. So it's going to be, it's going to, it may be the new winner. Interesting. Yeah. My, my favorites are definitely peanut butter and toasted almond coconut. Uh, yeah. My husband really loves the the new uh, buttered maple pecan, but I I don't know. I, it's funny because there's a lot of different flavors, and people definitely have their their favorites there. But the texture is different. I mean, for somebody that's not tried a keto brick, I mean, tell them what the brick is really like, like when you're eating it, how you yeah, eat it. <laughs> it's definitely not a normal bar texture. Like if you were used to biting into a Snickers bar, it definitely is not a Snickers bar. Um, I mean, the, the base is cacao butter, which is super high in stearic acid. Uh, that, that's what gives it its shelf stability because it has a much higher melting point. And it's kind of like um, a similar texture to like chocolate, dark chocolate. So um, not quite as hard as, as chocolate, but not too far from it. So definitely doesn't have that, um, you know, just ease of 
you know, cutting into like a Snickers bar would, but, uh, but I like my one every single day. Uh, a lot of people don't eat that much because it's a thousand calories each. So they'll partition it up. They'll melt them down into smaller bite-sized pieces or they'll cut them up or they'll put them in a recipe or something like that. But for me, yeah. I just go ahead and go. This like entire brick that I'm holding here, it's a thousand calories, but it's perfect ketogenic macronutrients. Uh, so, you know, roughly 70, 75% fat. Uh, then the rest mostly is protein and super low in carbs. Um, uh, the ingredients are super clean. It's got some Redmond real salt in there, mm -hmm. a little bit of a uh, little bit of stevia in some of them, um, depending on which flavor you're getting, but really mostly it's this raw organic cacao butter and a uh, little bit of grass fed whey in some of the flavors. So, uh, I use keto bricks all the time. We love them over here. You can melt them. You can drizzle them over things, or a lot of people will melt them down into, you know, smaller uh, pieces so you can portion them out because it is a thousand calories. Another thing I love to do is just chop a brick in half. Boom. 500 calories for one meal for lunch. Uh, it's shelf stable, which I love because I can keep it in a bag or we can take it hiking or, I mean, that's the cool part for me is it's not something you have to heat up. Yep. and worry about. So, um, awesome. So you guys go check out keto brick and, uh, it's, it's a cool product and it's cool what they're doing, uh, over there with the whole team. Okay. So let's dive back in, uh, to your, to your background and, and bodybuilding and, um, tell us what your daily routine is like right now. Oof, my daily routine right now is a little crazy because we got this baby on the way and the book Baby's up I'm, everything. I'm working on. <laughs> Yeah, and it ain't even born yet. Like last night, we spent two and a half hours at this birthing class, uh, and it starts like way past my bedtime. So I'm here in this birthing class, learning how to go about birthing a baby and not sleeping. So my sleep's all jacked up and and everything else. But generally, I wake up pretty early, around three or four in the morning, uh, do some reading, work on uh, my clients, work on emails, and then I go to the gym, train pretty early, and then I start the day with uh, our crew. So our crew meets here at the compound at eight. Uh, we have a meeting, and then. We get the production plan going on. We have keto bricks getting produced every single day. I've got a media guy. We do some filming, recording content for the YouTube channel, the podcast, things of that nature. Uh, Crystal's working on all kinds of things within the keto brick business, but also with her Lady Savage business. And uh, yeah, most of my day is just podcasting, content creation. Uh, I work out, I think I said that, yeah, I work out before the day starts. And then I'll typically do some light cardio in the afternoon, go for a run or something like that. Chip, our media guy, he's big into MMA. So every week we've been uh, leaving early from work an hour early on Wednesdays and we all do MMA together. So we're all punching each other and kicking each other. And it's been pretty good too. <laughs> Uh-oh, don't, don't mess with the, don't mess with the boss. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us what your eating schedule is like. Uh, so I typically do about two meals a day when my calories are in a maintenance or a surplus or even a slight deficit. Uh, so I'll wake up, have a fatty coffee, pretty much like a fat fast in the morning. And then training usually around six o'clock in the morning, start getting hungry at around 11 or noon. I'll have my first meal then, And then my second meal around dinner. And then that's pretty much the, the entirety of my day as far as, you know, the meal consumption and frequency. Yeah. Um, when you were telling us your story, you were talking a lot about you know, people in the bodybuilding world and relationships with food and talking a little bit about your history of disordered eating, binging, purging. I think I find in the keto space, there are a lot of people that come from those types of places and why the ketogenic diet seems to, to give them some healing. I, you know, I don't know all the answers to that, but it almost seems like the psychology of prep and bodybuilding would be more likely to send somebody like that into a tailspin. Can you talk about just kind of the mentality and psychology behind prep and bodybuilding and dieting down and, and reverse dieting? Yeah. So bodybuilding, I mean, to get yourself to that level of body composition, you know, I typically compete at sub 5% body fat and that's not sustainable. It's not even healthy. Um, and it's not normal. So it's hard to intuitively eat and get to that level. I mean, you could probably do it, but it would be much, much more difficult to try and intuitively eat because you have to push past whatever natural signals your body is telling you from like a hunger and satiety standpoint, because to get to sub 5% body fat, you're not really going to eat intuitively whenever you're hungry and stop whenever you're full, because you have to push beyond that to lose that level of body fat. Um, all the while continuing with your training, trying to stay on top of your sleep, trying to optimize your hormone function. So it's, it's very restrictive in the sense of you're eating less than you typically would be drawn to eat. And you're doing so over the course of several months. 
So when that show is over, many competitors who don't implement a proper reverse diet and scale back on the calories in a healthy, healthy manner, they just like go all out. They need everything in sight and they'll have a negative rebound. They'll gain 20, 25 pounds in a few days. I gained, I think 24 pounds in 48 hours after my first show. And that just wow. totally screwed with my head because I'd worked so hard to achieve a certain look and then just, you know, threw it all away seemingly in an instant. And there's so much of a psychological aspect that goes with doing a prep. But when you're so restricted with your food and then that show is over and you don't have a plan to reverse out of that properly, you're more than likely going to fail. Uh, so really kind of diving into the reverse diet and this importance of that is, is super, super key. Um, and a lot of, I mean, like you said, I don't know why a lot of competitors or a lot of people find the ketogenic diets higher in fat is more liberating from those, ten, those tendencies. You know, there's studies out there that show that carbohydrates are more satiating than fats, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think the hyper palatability of a lot of these processed sugars in tandem with carbs and fats could be a trigger. Um, I mean, I was just having a question with, with our crew the other day, like if I've got two items of, you know, keto muffins, for instance, one savory and one sweet with identical calories, which one are you more than likely to over consume? And everyone mm -hmm. said that the sweet option. Uh, so I don't know if the sweetener, the cephalic phase of insulin response is having an effect effect there, but for whatever reason, it's easy to overconsume carbohydrates, processed sugars, things of that nature. And I feel like by removing that from the equation and practicing more of an elimination as opposed to moderation approach and getting the majority of your calories from high quality, nutrient dense, single ingredient options is just far superior. So you think going from your days of eating low fat, high carb. So we're talking traditional chicken and rice type prep to eating high fat, low carb more, you know, fatty meats, keto bricks and no carbs, you feel like your satiety, like tell us the differences and why you feel that approach is easier for you. Well, in the context of a very, like towards the tail end of a prep, when your calories are very low and your body fat is very low, traditionally preps involve very low dietary fat. Like I've competed with people that looked amazing, but they would go as far as to remove the fish oil pills from their diet because they were trying to get rid of every single minuscule amount of fat coming in. And when you look at, you know, every cell in your body is encapsulated in a layer of fats, your hormones like testosterone precursor to that is cholesterol, obviously a fat. So when you remove all of your dietary fat and you have very minimal body fat to tap into, everything just starts shutting down. Your metabolism is going to be downregulated as a result of the lower calories your hormones are going to start shifting negatively as a result of the lower calories and the lower fat. So by keeping dietary fat relatively high in the context of a deficit, I found that to be just much healthier uh, from a hormonal standpoint, from a psychological standpoint. So that's been really good for me and a lot of other competitors. I mean, I've had several clients that have done traditional preps, then worked with me and, and done it with a ketogenic approach. And they all say the same thing. So it's not just specific to me and my level of sustainability. I think there's some common ground here with a lot of people. And I think a lot of it just stems from if you're in a caloric deficit and your body fat's very low and you're taking in very minimal dietary fat, that's just not optimal from a performance standpoint. Yeah. I couldn't agree more as a, you know, medical provider. I think it's hard in the prep bodybuilding space. There's a lot of very knowledgeable people, you know, about bodybuilding and competing, but don't really understand endocrinology and some of the downstream, you know, effects of, long-term and, you know, we've seen that, right. You see bodybuilders and a lot of it has to do with, you know, performance enhancing drugs, but they die early, they die of things, you know, nobody's monitoring this. And so I just have to applaud you for thinking about those things, first of all, because I've seen bodybuilders who eat and prep very low fat and they have very men with very low testosterone, women who have essentially no estradiol, no estrogen. And when you think about these things long-term, I mean, for, for a woman in particular, estrogen is super important for your bones, for your heart, for your brain. So if you're going years of your life where you're living with no estrogen, that's a big deal. And as Robert highlighted, our sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone are literally made from cholesterol. I mean, they're literally made from cholesterol. So if you're not getting in dietary cholesterol, your body's going to take it from somewhere and your cell membranes are, I mean, it's literally just going to start taking it from, from other substrates within your body. And so it can have a huge impact on, on your health. Um, back to just the mentality side, you know, obviously everybody listening, like very few people go into to bodybuilding. It's definitely, you know, something that's, that's not for everybody, but I'm sure there's somebody listening who, you know, uh, 
even the mentality of trying to lose a hundred pounds, like, are there things that you do to, you know, sharpen that saw? Like, what's your experience been like? From a, from a psychological standpoint? Yeah. 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 So I've always described bodybuilding as more so a mental sport than a physical one. I mean, you have to, you have to sacrifice, like you have to go without, whether that means going without excess calories, whether that means going without, you know, partying on the weekends and sacrificing your sleep, your training, things of that nature. Uh, but for me, that that's, that's empowering. Like knowing that I can take an adversity, uh, make the most of it and become better for it is just empowering. And I mean, a competition prep is pretty, pretty short in the grand scheme of life. I mean, four to six months worth of time prepping is, is not that long. And if you can come out the other side of that, a totally transformed person, more capable and more confident in your capabilities, then that spills over into other aspects of your life. Like I'm a better businessman, husband, soon to be father because of the traits that I've developed in my bodybuilding endeavors. I mean, it is literally the quintessential definition of discipline, consistency, and hard work. And when you master that, by definition, you master those character traits and then you just benefit in so many more ways than, than bodybuilding. I mean, even if you don't step on stage and compete against other competitors, everybody is a bodybuilder. I mean, they're either building their bodies up or they're putting on too much fat and, you know, toxins that are going to eventually tear their bodies down. So everybody should view themselves as a bodybuilder, whether they step on stage or not. And if you do a well implemented bodybuilding approach with the right nutrition, the right training, the right, you know, protocol, then it's just going to add years to your life. I mean, I mean, the ketogenic diet paired with resistance training, I've always said is like the closest thing we've found to the fountain of youth. And if you're able to do that, you know, even if you're not hitting PRs in the gym, if you're able to simply be more mobile into your later years, because you've got more muscle, you've got better tendon and health and, and joint strength, you're going to benefit. You're going to win. Yeah. I mean, my followers know I'm, I'm a huge fan of muscle as an organ of longevity. It just makes you hard to kill from a metabolic perspective. It's most likely to, um, to save you. If you ever get into a situation where you're debilitated, you, you know, you're bedridden in a bed, you lost your left leg or you get cancer or you get hit with X, Y, Z in life, having muscle is a really good metabolic reserve. Um, and as we age, we naturally lose muscle and you can still gain it. Even if you're older, for all our listeners out there that are 60, 70 years old, it's never too late. Uh, and it's, it's use it or lose it. So I love that message. Um, when it comes to hormones, Robert, do you, and clients that you work with, do you recommend they get baseline lab testing or anything like that before somebody goes into competition prep? Yeah, for sure. I mean, cause it is going to get down regulated, but if, if you haven't gotten that baseline test, you have no way to quantify how much it's been impacted. So I personally like to get a baseline test in the very beginning before my calories start to drop about halfway through. And then again, at the very you know apex of that deficit. Um, and then again, honestly, when I start doing the reverse diet and return back to some degree of maintenance. Uh, but yeah, having those numbers, I mean, they're just they're just incredibly valuable piece of information. And it's it's kind of a pain in the butt to go to the doctor's office and sit in the lobby to get labs drawn, but I'll just order the, the panels online, go to like a quest diagnostic center and get those get those numbers and then have that so that I can kind of see how things are impacted by the the prep by the drop in calories, by the training, by the lack of sleep, by the stress, all that stuff is going to happen in a prep. So being able to quantify it is, is pretty empowering. And I feel I've had so many competitors that, that did check their blood work uh, when they're doing a traditional approach versus a ketogenic approach. And their, their, their numbers never really drop as much, which for me is pretty enlightening because that just goes to show their calories are oftentimes pretty much the same versus a you know keto prep versus a traditional prep. Their, their calories are going to have to continue to drop regardless. But if their hormones are more stable, I mean, that's going to be a more, a more muscle preservative you know technique right there in itself, being able to maintain the lean mass you built up to that point because your hormones are in check is just a better way to go. Yeah, it'd be super interesting to create a study with uh, a number of people on both sides of the fence. And um, I'm not aware that it's necessarily been done, but um, Robert coached my husband, Ben, last year in his very first competition. And so, of course, <laughs> if you live with Dr. Fit and Fabulous, you get to be a guinea pig. So I made him uh, test before, you know, during and after. And I was so excited to text Robert and tell him because it was crazy that uh, he maintained his testosterone level almost uh, to pre prep levels, even at that really low body fat, sexual function was all normal. Um, I was really 
actually mind blown watching him go through the prep. Um, he really, he wasn't hangry. He wasn't like, he just seemed to do it so effortlessly. Um, and so it's interesting to me to watch people use this approach, but you're right. Like even when I mentioned, oh yeah, he did his prep ketogenic people are like, what? Like it still has such a, a weird connotation to people in, in that world. Yeah. And I mean, and prep is going to be hard no matter what diet you're following. Um, but it's kind of like, what are you going to be able to do that just hedges the bets and, and puts the odds in your favor? And even, even if my clients don't get all these labs drawn, like I'll have clients that'll message me, you know, the week of like during peak week, and they're still having sex during peak week. And that's just an anomaly in the grand scheme of things. Cause most competitors that follow traditional approach are like a zombie for the last month of their prep. And they don't want to do anything outside of their norm. So just simply be able to have your life back and function at higher rates in the context of a deep deficit in a prep is, is worthwhile. Yeah. And I think that's kind of some of the smoke and mirrors of bodybuilding too, Robert. And I'd love for you to touch on this is, you know, people do a prep and they look lean and mean and shredded and awesome. And they take all these photos and they're like, those are the photos they use on their social media for like nine months out of the year. And then people see that and they're like, damn, I want to look like that when that person looked like that for one day, you know, mm-hmm. literally like a day. Um, how often should somebody be prepping? How much time should you take between competitions? Yeah. So this is, a, this is a good question. Cause you're right. So many people, especially with social media, they, they, it's a lot sexier to showcase the abs that you have or the weight that you've dropped more so than it is the, the weight that you've gained or the less definition you have in a reverse diet. A good rule of thumb, I think is to have like a three to one to a five to one ratio. Basically, if you spend, you know, three months in a deficit, then spend nine months in a maintenance or surplus, kind of like that three to one uh, protocol there. Because when you think about it, like I, my typical clients all recommend a four to six month time span for prepping for a show. Then you've got two or three months worth of reverse dieting after that to get you back up to your baseline maintenance intake. Then, I mean, that's nine months out of the year right there. So if you go right back into another cut, then you're going right back into a deficit and you're not letting your hormones and your metabolism have a chance to upregulate again. So I'll typically take two years, sometimes three years off in between competitive seasons so that I can have more time in a surplus building more lean muscle tissue so that when I do step on stage again, I look better than I did the last time. A lot of competitors fall into this trap of just constantly overcompeting. They spend more time in a deficit than in a surplus and they wind up looking worse and worse and worse every year as opposed to better and better. And you want to avoid that at all costs. Unfortunately, a lot of people notice that they're looking worse and worse over year, every year because they're not giving their time their body time to recover, that's when they'll start introducing these performance enhancing drugs as a kind of way to hedge those side effects. And that's obviously not the route that I want to go down, uh, but that's super common. I mean, you see coaches, you know, misinformed coaches advocating their amateur athletes that have competed once or, or not at all to get on these performance enhancing drugs for a $20 plastic trophy and just sacrifice their health. And it just isn't worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty sad, unfortunately. It seems like uh, this last year we've seen headline after headline of people, you know, dying of heart attacks in their thirties, forties, fifties, because of misuse and abuse of some of these substances. So um, let's talk about, let's talk about the methodology of calories and how does one determine where to start? And can you talk about the science of actually bringing that down? Like how precise it really is. So there's lots of different ways coaches go about it. My preferred way is to to first make sure that the competitor is at a healthy maintenance intake to begin with. So if they're coming at me and they've been chronically under eating for years, they're not going to be an ideal candidate for going through a deficit, doing a prep and and losing weight. Uh, so I'll make sure that they've been at a healthy intake for a long enough time to start at a healthy baseline. Um, just some general ballpark numbers for my female clients. I like to see that above 2000 calories. Uh, like you started, what was it like 2,400, 2,500 calories, if I remember yeah. correctly. Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty healthy intake for most females. Most guys are north of that. You know, like I think I start my prep at around 3,000 to 3,400 calories at a maintenance. And basically by having that higher caloric intake at the onset, you ensure that you've got enough caloric runway from which to taper those calories over the course of the next four to six months. If you're chronically under eating to begin with, and then you go into a prep and you're only eating, you know, 1300 calories at the onset. And then by the end of it, you're eating 700 calories. That's just not healthy and not necessary. Uh, So making sure you've got a healthy metabolic baseline is key. And then over the course of those four to six months, I'll gradually be dropping calories that whole time 
Uh, I'll be redistributing macronutrients based off of how many grams of proteins and fats you respond best to. Carbs are kept pretty low as a default because I do a ketogenic protocol. Um, and then we just basically figure out what macro distribution ratio you respond well to in the context of those ever decreasing calories. Um, and they're, they're never really crazy big adjustments. I mean, I'm a typically adjusting by five or 10 gram increments, which makes things much more sustainable. A lot of coaches will hack off, you know, 500, 700 calories, you know, week after week until their body plateaus and they'll take out another 500 calories. And that's just a, it's kind of screws with your head when you have to reduce meal after meal because you don't have the calories for it by keeping things very short and concise with five or 10 gram incremental adjustments. I mean, you're adding or subtracting an ounce or two of cheese or ground beef or an egg. I mean, it's very, very small, but very, very sustainable. Yeah. So for people listening, the level of precision in what these people are doing is literally you are weighing your food, like you're weighing you. I mean, it's not just like ballparking a tablespoon of heavy cream. I mean, literally it's like food scale every single time because the adjustment from week to week, when I prepped with Robert for Mrs. America, it was like 50 calories a week, like that we were going down. I mean, that's a tiny, that's like one bite for a lot of people, depending on like what kind of like fatty meal you're eating. And so this is not just like willy nilly. And, and that is one of the things about tracking is we know statistically in studies that whether it's, whether it's conscious or unconscious, people are not good at tracking. I mean, even when we say, okay, put 2000 calories on a plate, even if you gave the person like a weight scale, like there's just so many inaccuracies with tracking. And so um, you have to do the best you can, but you literally have to be like weighing, looking at every serving size um, and it can get exhausting. Like it really can. Yeah, it for sure can, which is why I don't recommend people do that year round indefinitely. I'll do that. You know, I'll, I'll track everything to the T when I'm in a cutting phase for a competition, but then like right now I'm in a building phase and I make sure I'm getting enough calories and make sure I'm getting enough protein to recover and build. And I make sure I get enough fat to have the energy, but I'm not tracking everything to the T. I mean, one day I may be 3000, one day I may be 3,400. Like it's not exhaustive because I'm, I'm giving myself time to eat more intuitively in the building phase, but that makes it much easier to be as strict as I am during the cutting phase. Yeah. And I, the point I'm really trying to get across is that, you know, I have patients all the time that come in and they're like, I want to lose 15 pounds. And they've tried like X, Y, Z approach, but sometimes you really have to be honest with yourself about what you're consuming because you might think you're eating at a certain level and you're really not. Um, and I find that these wearable devices that everybody wears completely overestimate people's, uh, energy expenditure as mm -hmm. far as, you know, how much they're moving and exercising. And so you can't be using that as part of the equation for eating more because they, they're also, you know, quite inaccurate. I find. Yeah. The wearables, I mean, the estimated caloric expenditures, those spit out at you. I like using those as a way to make sure your, your neat activity is not just dropping drastically as the calories drop, but I would never recommend people use their estimated caloric expenditure via the wearables as a way to factor in and adjust their macros. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about training, Robert. Um, how often do you train? How often should you do upper and lower body? What if somebody is like never lifted before? Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat as the saying goes with regard to training. <laughs> and, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of like nutrition. It's what's most sustainable for you. Um, I like training, you know, six days a week or so, five or six days a week, depending on my schedule and kind of what I'm doing there. And I'll typically do a body part split in which I don't have like an upper body, lower body day. It's like, you know, today I'm doing back and tomorrow I'm doing triceps and chest or something of that nature. Um, but I've seen a lot of success with a, uh, it's a six day rotational split. So basically for every eight day training block, I'm training six days, two of those are rest days. Uh, that does a few different things by having it be based off of an eight day cycle. My chest day, for instance, never falls on Monday, two weeks in a row consecutively, which is kind of like built into the program. Cause a lot of people, they have, you know, international chest days, Monday, they go in there, they work chest really hard. And then Friday is legs and they just don't feel it. Cause the week's been long. So they skip out on legs by having it broken into an eight day cycle. You know, it never falls on the same day. So it kind of averages out your good days and bad days. And I've got that built in a way that I've got uh, each muscle group's basically getting hit twice uh, over the course of that eight day window. And one of those days is more of a heavy focus. So fewer reps, heavier weights. And one of those days is more of a hypertrophy focus with more repetitions, slightly less weight, but more focus of a blood flow. Uh, but I like that. That's worked really well for me. 
But that's not to say that people have to do that. I've had clients that simply do at home band workouts and do really well. I've had clients that do, you know, a push pull leg split or an upper day, lower day. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to do it as long as you're doing it and it's sustainable for you're implementing some form of progressive overload, getting heavier, getting, uh, you know, more frequent, having more intensity, just giving your body reason to grow, adapt and get better. Yeah. Yeah. How often should somebody be resting if you're doing, you know, high volume resistance training? Uh, so I do pretty much like two days a week, roughly. Um, it's going to bend kind of on your age or your muscle maturity, uh, the, the level of intensity you're doing. One thing that I do like to do is implement a deload week every six to eight weeks or so. So basically uh, with that deload week, it's, it's in addition to the planned rest days, but I'll have a week in which I go through my same workout routine, but I'll do so at like half the weight or half the intensity. So I'm still focusing on blood flow, but I'm basically giving my central nervous system a break so that when I come back from that deload week, I'm able to go and push it even harder. Awesome. Okay. So when anybody walks into the gym, seems like there's 9,000 treadmills, a couple million ellipticals. Let's talk about cardio. Cause I think, you know, women in particular are much more obsessed with, with cardio. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to recomposition your body, how much cardio should you be doing? How do you balance that with resistance training? Yeah. So most people, they, they put a halo around cardio and I like to think of cardio as like a minimum viable dose. So I like to do as little cardio as possible to elicit a favorable response in the context of a competition prep in which the entire goal is body recomposition, losing body fat while maintaining as much muscle as possible. I'll like to start with as little cardio as possible. And then as the body stops responding as much to the nutritional manipulations, we can slightly scale up the cardio. So I like to think of cardio as having an inverse relationship with calories. As calories drop, cardio gradually increases. If you start out a cut and you're doing seven days a week of cardio, two hours a day, there's no room left to really increase it further. So you've basically thrown away the trick up your sleeve. If you keep that up your sleeve and use it as a way to kind of slowly scale things up as your body starts to plateau, you'll be able to do so in a much more sustainable fashion and you won't burn out on the treadmill. Yeah. Yeah. So for everybody listening, like what Robert does with me is we do stair climber and we choose how many minutes and we choose what level. And then we use those two parameters to say, okay, we're going to go up by a minute or we're going to go up by a level or up by three minutes. And that way we can titrate that from week to week to week. Um, it's not just like get on the treadmill and walk. Like you need to know like the intensity, the speed, those types of things to be able mm -hmm. to manipulate those variables. Um, talk to us about electrolytes and fluid management. I've always heard like in the bodybuilding world, like just like huge manipulation of water, like, especially as people are coming into like prep week, like, what do you do? Is there a difference being ketogenic? Yeah. So it's interesting because like peak week has all this folklore around, it. like there's all these different hacks to, to peak for the show. And some of them are really unhealthy and totally unnecessary. So it depends on which coach you ask, but a lot of them will suggest, you know, a, a water loading phase and a salt loading phase. And then several days where you cut that out completely and basically dehydrate yourself and do a bunch of depletion workouts and cut out carbs. And then they'll bring in a bunch of sodium and water the day before, and they'll add a bunch of carbs in and they're doing all this stuff to try and manipulate and peak for that very short window on stage. But for me, I mean, you can bypass most of that, if not all of that. And the reason being, I mean, when you're in a peak week, your, your body is used to doing something very routine because you've been doing it for the past four to six months of your prep. So to introduce a crazy off the wall variable that you don't know how your body's going to respond is just dangerous. A lot of competitors will take in too much fluid. They'll take in too much salt. They'll, they'll take in too many carbs if they're doing carbs and they'll spill over. And that basically means they'll have a lot of extra fluid in their subcutaneous layer of skin, which basically washes out all their definition, all their vascularity. They'll look much more, you know, worse on stage on show day by keeping things pretty well consistent with what you've done up to that point, you can bypass all that risk. So that said, you do want to peak properly. Um, and there is a few manipulations you can make to kind of add a little bit of polish. Uh, what I like to do is keep pretty much the water intake consistent throughout the entire week. Uh, no change is necessary there. And then increase sodium ever so slightly the day before on Friday. What that's going to do is draw in any of the fluids in your subcutaneous layer of skin into the actual muscle tissue, make your muscles fill out a little bit more, make that skin look a bit thinner. Uh, which is going to showcase more of the vascularity and the striations that you've worked so hard for. And then you don't have to worry about there being much of a negative response. And since you're not there, since, you know, with my protocol, you're not doing carbohydrates. You don't have to worry about over consuming carbs because those are left out of the equation. If you're 
doing a peak week proper and you're doing a ketogenic approach, there's no need to have that increase in carbohydrates. You can fill out, replenish your muscle glycogen just fine by having the right amount of dietary fats and proteins in your refeed meal with ample sodium. And then through that week, we're doing a little bit less intense workout training. So that's going to allow your muscles to replenish glycogen as well. Do you recommend a certain amount of sodium per day, potassium per day? That's going to be highly individualized. A two to one ratio of sodium to potassium works pretty well for most people. Uh, my sweet spot is about 6,000 milligrams of sodium throughout the day. And then I'll have, you know, an additional 2000 milligrams on uh, the day before the show. So I'll bump that up to about 8,000 milligrams. And that gives me just the amount that I need to draw in that extra water weight or that extra water retention. But, uh, but yeah, it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. So the first few weeks before actual peak week, I typically have my clients go through a, a mock peak week in which we're really getting all that honed in so that when we get to the actual peak week, we know exactly what they're going to respond well to. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the idea of a refeed? Like why use it? What is the, what's the science there? Yeah. So in traditional bodybuilding settings for competitors that are using carbs, they'll do that carb depletion you know, in the, in leading up to that show, then they'll reintroduce a bunch of carbs to super compensate muscle glycogen and bring a fuller look. If you're fat adapted, as was illustrated in the faster study, you can replenish muscle glycogen just as efficiently as our carb dependent counterparts. So there's no need to have those carbohydrates for them. Um, so in the context of a ketogenic prep, the refeed basically gives your body more calories, more proteins, more fats to fill out and look better on show day. And honestly, from a psychological standpoint, it makes the lower calories that you're experiencing in that phase of the prep much more sustainable because calories will continue to drop week after week. But when you have that bolus of calories the day before the show, your body just soaks that up, makes the most of it. And you do look a little bit better. You have more energy. And with that increase in sodium, you just you have more vascularity. Your blood pressure increases a little bit. That allows you to get a better pump, more blood flow. You just look a little bit better. Okay. So we talked about this peak week, which is essentially the week leading into a show. Can you talk about what that's like? Um, all, all the different variables, I, obviously men and women, it's, you know, women are like thinking about like, they have to get their, their tan and their makeup and their hair. Obviously Robert's not getting his hair done, but like all of those little variables and like travel, like what if your show's not, you know, like where you are, can you just talk about the experience that you've had with, with a lot of different peak weeks? Yeah. So peak week is, is interesting because there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, typically you do have to travel for a show. So you have to make sure you've got a hotel or an Airbnb. You have to get there. And if you're driving long distance or flying, that can cause some additional stress and fluid retention. You obviously don't want that on stage day. Um, so you got to get that dialed in. You've got the hair and makeup, you've got the tan. Uh, so you got to get the spray tan scheduled, or if you're using like a dream tan topical solution that you're putting on your skin, you got to get that all dialed in the hair removal, you have to get optimized before you put the tan on because you don't want to be looking like Chewbacca on stage. Uh, so you got to get all that dialed in. Hair and makeup, if you're doing a natural show, you've got the, the polygraph, the drug testing, uh, usually the night before the show. So there's a ton of variables. And the more you can control for those variables, they're not surprises that leave you, you know, unchecked and not really knowing what to do is, is key. Um, and a lot of federations are going to be different. So knowing your federation, knowing what the, the venue is going to be like, knowing what the show promoter is expecting, all of that's super, super important. But if you're prepared and you know exactly how your body is going to respond to the, the macro manipulations, uh, to the sodium, to the water, to the training, then you can go into peak week with a pretty good degree of certainty that everything that you have control over is going to work out well. And then at that point, you pretty much just have to uh, let it happen, you know, let it, let it, let it be and be stoic about it. And anything that you can't control, just make the most of it. Tell us what show day is like for somebody that has never been to one of these competitions or any tips or tricks you have for people out there. Yeah. So show days is pretty cool. I mean, it could be very well organized depending on the show and the promoters, they could have everything dialed in they have the times accurate, uh, or they could be totally, you know, off the wall crazy, in which case you're running around not knowing when you're going on stage. And that's just obviously not optimal, but um, from a nutrition standpoint, what I like to do is, is keep things. Uh, so they're all, all throughout the prep, you know, we've got macros tracked on show day. It's not so much a specific macro goal that you're looking for. You're just trying to optimize for peaking at the very specific time when you step on stage. So you, things are kind of having to adjust on the fly. So I'll typically recommend, uh, you know, a fatty coffee in the morning, a uh, very light breakfast, several hours before stage time. So that could be, you know, a couple pieces of bacon, hard boiled eggs, something of that nature. And then from there, pretty much every hour to hour and a half, 
uh, a fatty substance, kind of like this is where the keto brick was basically born. I do like a quarter of a keto brick every two hours or so, hour and a half, two hours before I step on stage. So I'm getting a little bit of sodium from that to continue filling out and looking better, but not so much food volume that it, it causes any bloat or, uh, you know, stomach distension. Um, and then throughout the show, you're pretty much just waiting for your turn to, to step on stage. You've got your pump up section. So you've got to, you know, time that properly. And then you go on stage, you hit all the poses, uh, depending on what you know division you're in. And you just put your best self out there and hope the judges like what they see and uh, enjoy every single minute of it. And then after that, you get your awards and hopefully you, you like the awards you got and you go to the celebratory meal, eat a big steak and call it a day. Okay. And so then after you have come down from your show day high, talk about the importance of reverse dieting. You've kind of mentioned that a lot of times this is when people just let go of it all. Yeah. So what I like to recommend is, you know, go out to eat that evening with your friends, family. And if you're doing a ketogenic approach, don't deviate from your ketogenic diet. Like the worst thing you can do is to be strict keto for six months and then totally go off the bender and eat a bunch of carbs and sugar and feel terrible for several days thereafter. Uh, so what I like to recommend is if you're going with a ketogenic approach, keep it ketogenic, go to like a Brazilian steakhouse or something, eat all the meat that you want experience all those tastes and textures uh, and, and spend quality time with your family and loved ones, but don't deviate from the lifestyle that's brought you that success in the first place. Uh, and honestly, if you're keto adapted and you're just eating the meats and whatnot, you're, you're probably not going to respond uh, poorly to it. I mean, you'll, you'll gain a little bit of weight. You'll probably have a little bit more fluid retention the next day, but you're not going to wake up 25 pounds heavier like I did. Um, so do that. And then kind of give yourself some grace on Sunday as well. Kind of enjoy yourself there. Uh, again, keeping things keto. And then that following Monday after the show, really focusing on getting back on a plan, a strategy, doing a reverse diet, gradually bring those calories back up uh, with a strategic, you know, refeed implemented in there, keto refeed, um, and just slowly bring those calories back up to return to a healthy maintenance so that you're, you're not having the negative implications of eating in a unnecessary surplus uh, and giving yourself time to let your hormones, your metabolism, and just your relationship with food all heal. Yeah. The body definitely doesn't like extreme swings, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one way or another. Um, awesome. That's such good advice. What's the, what's the most favorite show you've ever competed in? Most memorable. Most memorable. So there's, there's uh, several shows in Washington that I typically compete in because I did a lot of this when I was living in Washington. So I'll still go back and compete in those shows, even though I'm living in Arkansas. So there's one that is the, uh, it's a WNBF show. It's a bunch of natural competitors. And I've never won the overall title at that show. I won my pro card at a different show in Eastern Washington uh, that, that year in 2017. But this particular show in Washington, um, it's the Puget Sound Pro-Am and it's in uh, Marysville, Washington, but all the competitors there, like we're all cool. Like we all uh, compete with one another and we all want to best the other, but we're all friends at the end of the day. So there's this camaraderie and having, you know, camaraderie with the people you're backstage with the people you're on stage with just makes the whole experience much, much better. Like they'll be the first to help you out with anything you need. But then when time comes to compete, like everyone's out there trying to rip each other's head off, but we do so out of love and you just, you, you want them to bring their best package that you're beating the best version of them. Um, so yeah, that, that's definitely my favorite show. I'll be doing that again next time for sure. I was just about to ask when is keto savage coming back to the stage? <laughs> uh, probably uh, my, my plan as of right now is to start prepping again in November of this year, which will put me competing in 2023. Actually. Oh. Yeah. It's 2022 right now. Yeah. So I'll be competing in 2023. Well, you're going to have your hands full this next year. If yeah. you don't mind me asking, tell us about, um, tell us about Crystal's pregnancy. She been staying, staying low carb keto. Yeah. I've got to give huge props to her because, uh, we're 25 weeks in as of this past Wednesday and she has been strict keto the whole time. She has not once deviated from it. I mean, the highest her total carbs have gotten is like 30 grams, maybe. Uh, so totally strict keto. Uh, she's felt great everything's in, everything's gotten, you know, the, the feedback that we're looking for from all the, the midwives, um, everything's just been perfect. So her pregnancy has been smooth sailing thus far. And, uh, I'm just excited to meet this little guy. What's going to be your role. So you guys went to a birth class last night. Tell me, tell me your thoughts. Cause this is what I do day in and day out. Yeah. <laughs> I told her two babies last night. So like, our, I mean, we're, we're doing probably the, the less conventional route. We're doing a home birth. We've got a midwife. Um, 
we're not doing any epidurals. Like we're going straight up hippie with it, you know, but, but I think that'll be good because I mean, it's at our home. We're comfortable there. We get to do things on our, on our terms. I mean, she's probably gonna do the water birth, uh, but there's just like no restrictions. Like we get to do what she's feeling like doing uh, when the day comes. And I think it'll be, I think it'll be great. Awesome. Is this baby going to change your training schedule at, at three and 4 a.m.? <laughs> I'm not really sure what we're going to do there. I think we're going to have like a playpen set up in the gym. That's one of the nice things about having our own gym. We can have like a little nursery set up in the gym, let the baby do his thing and uh, hopefully give us the time to, to work out. If not, then we'll probably just alternate. Like she'll hold the baby while I'm working out and vice versa. I'm just imagining Robert with this baby, like strapped to his chest while he's trying to deadlift. No deadlifting during nap time though. <laughs> deadlifting during nap time. <laughs> yeah. I can, I love it. I love it. I can just, I can picture it now, this little baby just, and then soon enough, he'll be up running around and picking up, picking up little weights with you guys. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, he's going to be my new, my new workout partner for sure. Baby savage for sure. Okay. So we end all the podcasts with something called the semen analysis. And earlier when Robert was talking about this amazing product called keto brick, he was highlighting that one of the awesome things in uh, the keto brick is stearic acid. And of course, one of the things on ketogenic diet is people, you know, like you can't eat the high fat, you can't eat that high saturated fat. It's going to cause heart disease and this, that, and the other. So I wanted to highlight stearic acid today for the semen analysis. So stearic acid is a saturated fatty acid. It's the 18 carbon chain. It's kind of a waxy, uh, solid substance. So the cacao butter that's in the, the keto bricks, that's why it, it, you know, it's not soft, like a snicker bar. It's, it's still got some, some firmness some waxiness to it. Um, but the name, the Greek word steer actually means tallow. So it's, it's an animal fat or animal fats have more stearic acid than plant fats, but this actually has, you know, shea butter, cacao butter actually are pretty high in stearic acid. So um, abundant animal fat up to 30% vegetable fat typically will only have less than 5% of stearic acid, um, except for the cocoa butter in the bricks is about 34% and uh, shea butter would be the other one. Um, but what's really cool is that in studies in humans, not, not in animals, in humans have shown that the fraction of dietary stearic acid that oxidatively desaturates to oleic acid is 2.4 times higher than palmitic acid. And uh, stearic acid is less likely to be incorporated into cholesterol esters. And in epidemiology and all clinical studies, it's shown that stearic acid was found to be associated with a lower LDL cholesterol in comparison with other saturated fatty acids. So if you're talking about just the influence of, of saturated fats, stearic acid is a really good one to have in the diet. Um, and I found another study from 2018. So just a couple of years ago, looking at dietary stearic acid and how it regulates the mitochondria in vivo in humans. This is a super cool study because everybody's hearing this word mitochondria, mitochondrial health, how your mitochondria relate to your metabolic health. And what they found is that high stearic acid in the diet actually signals something called mitofusion activity. And this helps with mitochondrial fusion. Uh, morphology and the mitochondrial function. So stearic acid is really good for supporting your metabolic health. Um, I know Robert eats a diet high in stearic acid because he's using the keto bricks. He's getting some from his other fatty animal meats. I eat the same way as him. Um, but another cool thing about stearic acid is that it's huge in the beauty industry. Uh, and so stearic acid, you'll find it in lots of your beauty products. Um, it's really good for your skin. You can actually put beef tallow on your skin if you're, if you're real hippie, <laughs> but, um, it doesn't clog your pores. So, you know, even though it's got that waxy substance, it works as an amazing surfactant and emulsifier. And, um, it's found, like I said, in lard, tallow, fatty meats, coconut, palm oil, cocoa butter, shea butter. So amen to stearic acid. Isn't that right, Robert? That's pretty cool. Amen to that for sure. Yeah. Did you, I mean, obviously you weren't thinking about stearic acid when you invented keto brick, but what was there other, I mean, when you're trying to create something with this much fat, was there other ingredients you looked at or did this seem like it worked the first time? Yeah. I mean, I didn't really know any of that about the stearic acid and the cacao butter when I formulated it originally. And I've since learned all this stuff. So it's, it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, <laughs> but the main thing about the, the cacao butter was that it has the highest shelf stability because of that 18 carbon bond. Um, and that just, it's just so much higher than any other fat source out there. Uh, so that was, that was the ticket for me. And then I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Brad Marshall's work, uh, fire in a bottle. He's, he's looked into steric acid being, I'm probably going to butcher this, but, uh, there's some compelling evidence that shows that steric acid actually increases insulin 
uh, resistance in the fat cell itself. So it basically makes the fat cells less likely to get fatter. Uh, so we want insulin sensitivity on a macro level overall, but at the actual adipocyte, we want it to be more insulin resistant. So I thought that was super interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much controversy right now with polyunsaturated fats and PUFAs and saturated fats. And, uh, you know, the science is of course ever evolving, but yeah, I've, I've looked at that literature and I just anecdotally clinically, I got to say, I don't know. I think it works. I feel amazing. Uh, you've worked with so many clients that, that, uh, eat and live this way. So I would say, be your own expert Yes, so indeed. Try it out for yourself, try it out for yourself and see what happens. Love it. Yeah. So Robert, tell people where they can find you, how they can work with you. How do they order some keto bricks? Yeah. So, uh, my whole thing is keto savage. So keto savage.com for online coaching and content, the podcast, uh, keto brick.com for the keto bricks. And then I'm not sure, like I said, when this podcast is going live, but my book will probably have gone live at this point and it'll be available at ketogenicbodybuilding.com. And there's also obviously available on Amazon, but uh, the book basically encompasses everything that we've talked about in a very well, you know, easy to digest format via the book. I love it. I love, I have, I've read Robert's book. I got a sneak peek copy that he sent to me and it is it is in depth. Like there's no detail that gets glazed over. If you are in the bodybuilding world, you're interested in understanding what ketogenic prep looks like, you know, Robert kind of gives his experience and he goes into every single detail about how to eat electrolytes, water, how to train mentality behind things, peak week, show day, reverse dieting. It's all in there. It's so thorough. So if you know anybody that's interested in natural body, natural bodybuilding, I highly suggest you check it out. Um, and then one last announcement, cause I haven't really made it public, but Robert coached Ben last year in his first bodybuilding show. And I watched Ben do his prep. Like I said, I thought it, he, he made it look so effortless to be honest. Um, and I had done so many things in 2020 and, uh, 2021. And so this year I'll be competing in my first show. And Robert's coaching me. We've got a show selected. It's going to be in April. I'm going to be competing in women's physique. Um, I'm a little scared, but I think if things don't scare you, they're probably not worth your time, to be honest. So you're going to kill it. I've got no doubt about it. I'm super excited <laughs> for you. I'm super excited for you to just experience this journey and all that it entails. So, so you're going to do great. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I think I had a lot of judgment about the sport. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it came from, seeing people with disordered eating and just knowing it was such a low fat approach. And so really seeing that somebody can do this low carbon ketogenic, I was like, okay, well, I mean, that's already how I live my life day in and day out. And it's just another level of titration. And I, I honestly find that, uh, there's so much less decision fatigue when I'm prepping. And Ben was just saying this too. He's, he's going to kind of, you know, kind of like quote unquote, kind of prep along with me just because we live in the same house and we got to, you know, eat the same foods and things like that. But, um, it really takes like, when, you know, like I'm eating this, 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 I'm eating this many calories, it takes away a lot of decisions throughout my day. And I've already, I've got my training scheduled. I honestly feel better when I'm in prep, like when yeah. I have too long of a leash, um, I, I tend to stray. I, it makes me feel unfulfilled. I don't, I don't know. I just don't feel good. So I think, I think some of it too, is that it really provides a structure to people that they can really kind of embrace. And then when they see the success, it just help, helps build that confidence in their, their uh, ability to do it. Yeah. I'm in complete agreement. I mean, I'm in a building phase now, but I'm probably going to start actually tracking my macros and being pretty strategic with the manipulation simply because I feel like my productivity just totally increases when I am that structured. All right, you guys. Well, thank you for listening to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thank you to Robert. Thank you to your wife, Crystal. And I cannot wait to meet baby Savage very soon. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a good day, everybody.